Today's Torah parsha is called Shemini, meaning eighth in Hebrew, and it's the 26th weekly Torah portion covering Leviticus 9, verse 1 through chapter 11, verse 47, referring to the eighth day on which Aaron and his sons were inducted as the priest of the tabernacle after seven days of consecration. From this parasha of Shemini, we derive 17 new mitzvot that I'll share about more later in detail after discussing some elements throughout the parasha first. Our parasha begins in chapter 9 with the words, Vahi bayom hashmini kara Moshe le aharon ul vane ul zikne Yisrael. And then in the eighth day, Moshe called to Aaron and his sons and the elders of Israel. And then it tells us what he said concerning Hashem's instruction about the different korbanot offerings. Now, at first glance, the beginning of our parsha Shemini about the eighth day would seem to belong better at the end of the previous parsha Zav, where it describes the first seven days of inauguration of the tabernacle. As the beginning of our parsha describes the final eighth day of inauguration when the divine presence fully descended into the tabernacle. But by breaking the passages to begin a new parsha in the middle of this story, the Torah appears to be hinting to us that the eighth day, while looking like a mere continuation of the days that preceded it, actually had a totally different character. So the discussion of the eighth day, Shemini, must begin a new chapter and parasha. Since there are seven days in a week, it follows that the number seven alludes to the cycle of the natural world. Eight, therefore, represents that which is beyond the world, the most sublime spiritual realm which defies any interaction with physicality. Being truly infinite, it can have no meaningful relationship with the finite. And it is this fundamental incompatibility between seven and eight to which the Torah alludes by placing Shemini in a parsha of its own. The Torah is telling us that eight, that which is infinite and godly, and seven, representing the worldly and the physical, cannot be mixed. That is to say, they can't be mixed by man alone. But God and his commands, of course, are not bound by the paradox of matter and spirit. Thus, when man follows God's commands to perform a particular task with a physical object, we witness a most unlikely fusion of opposites. The physical object, whose very nature it is to conceal the presence of God, now becomes a pure expression of the infinite divine will. Thus, the 613 mitzvot are, in effect, 613 bridges between 7 and 8. Consequently, it is through the observance of these mitzvot that God's presence will become visible within this physical world with the true and complete redemption, like the eighth day of inauguration, when the glory of God appeared to all the people, as it says in chapter 9, verse 23. And it shows a special correlation with the Spirit of the Most High descending on the eighth day as a type of that eighth day after the seventh millennial day consecration is over, and the people have been blessed by the High Priest Mashiach. So, we see there is a relationship between the numbers seven and eight in Torah. Seven is associated with the physical space and time, the level of holiness man is capable of reaching in this world is symbolized by seven, whereas eight represents a level of holiness beyond the normal confines of space and time. It is related to being wholly united with Hashem as he is in himself rather than as he is related to the world. This is why a circumcision is done on the eighth day also and can be performed on Shabbat, which is the seventh day of every week. Shabbat belongs to physical space and time, but circumcision belongs to the realm of the holy. Eight thus represents a level of holiness that goes beyond the idea that God and the world are two distinct entities. The number eight is associated with the time of total holiness. 
as seen in this parasha, the seven days working on the tabernacle prepared everyone for the eighth day when they experienced the presence of God. This is related to the idea of 7,000 years of human history followed by the eighth day of the Elom Haba, meaning the world to come. Now, Leviticus 9.2 says, And Moshe said to Aharon, Take you a young calf for a sin offering, and a ram for an ascent offering, without blemish, and offer them before the Lord. And to the children of Israel you shall speak, saying, Take a kid of the goats for a sin offering, and a calf and a lamb, both of the first year, without blemish, for a burnt offering, also a bullock and a ram for a peace offering, to sacrifice before God, and a meal offering mingled with oil. For today God will appear to you. We also see in Leviticus 9, verse 22 through 24, that the offerings were brought as instructed, following which Moshe and Aaron went into the tent of meeting and came out and blessed the people. And it says, The glory of God appeared to all the people. In an awesome display of Yah's holiness, Aharon the high priest blesses the people, and a fire consumes the burnt offering. At this point, the children of Israel shout and fall on their faces. The Holy One was pleased with their obedience, and he accepts their offerings by his Shekinah appearing again, the first time since the tabernacle was finished. Now, with all the preparations completed and the priest ready to minister, the tabernacle can begin to be used for what it was intended. The Talmud tells us that when the fire came down from heaven, one, it crouched majestically over the altar like a lion. And two, its flame was of a supernatural substance that it appeared like a solid. And three, it was able to devour even wet wood. And four, it caused no smoke. And this only happened on three other recorded occasions. One was at the birth of Samson, recorded in Judges 13. And the other was at the dedication of Solomon's temple, recorded in 2 Chronicles 7, as well as when Elijah challenged the prophets of Baal in 1 Kings 18. And then, of course, we also see it in Acts 2 with the tongues of fire at Pentecost on Shavuot. This brings us to chapter 10 of our parasha in Leviticus, where the focus then turns to Aharon's sons and the strange fire that they bring in contrast to Hashem's divine fiery glory that descended upon the tabernacle. Within a short amount of time, we see this tragedy coming to the house of Aharon when his sons Nadav and Avihu took each of them his censer and put fire in it and put incense on it, and offered strange fire before God, which he commanded them not. A fire went out from God's presence and consumed them, and they died before the Lord, it says in verse 1 and 2. Aharon's sons died on account of four things, it is said. Firstly, for drawing near, because they entered into the innermost precincts of the most holy place on their own terms, in their own way, at the wrong time. Secondly, for offering because they offered a sacrifice which they had not been commanded to offer. And thirdly, for the strange fire which they brought, not as commanded. And fourthly, for not having taken counsel from each other. As it says, each of them his censor, implying that they acted each on his own initiative, not taking counsel from one another. When you reflect on these descriptive verses, you can readily conclude that reverence, respect, and awe for the Holy One of Israel are some of the things that are absolutely necessary for his servants. Verse 3 of Leviticus 10 says, Then Moshe said to Aharon, It is what Hashem spoke, saying, By those who come near me I will be treated as holy, and before all the people I will be honored. So Aharon therefore kept silent. Aharon's sons, Nadav and Avihu, sinned with fire, and they were punished with death 
by fire. However, when within a few short verses, the text turns to the problem of serving Hashem while under the intoxicating influence of wine or strong drink. Hence, it has been concluded by scholars that it is conceivable that Nadav and Avihu could have been under the influence of alcohol and that they simply did not show a reverent fear of the Holy One. As an example for eternity, the dramatic loss of life by a consuming fire has indelibly reminded people in positions of spiritual responsibility that the Holy One requires absolute sobriety when one is conducting his priestly duties. In Ecclesiastes 5.1, it is written, Guard your steps when you go to the house of God, for to draw near to listen is better than to give the sacrifice of fools, for they don't know that they do evil. In the art scroll, Humash, it says that they went into the tabernacle after having wine on and confirms this. Many other rabbis also understand this to have been the case. The same fire which blessed the people for meeting his requirements of obedience in doing the things after his pattern according to his word destroyed those who did not. Surely our God is a consuming fire, as the scriptures say. Anyone who does not come to God the way he instructs us in his word is approaching him in rebellion and disobedience. That was the sin of Nadav and Avihu. They thought they could come to God another way, their own way. In doing so, they elevated themselves to a position of insolence to the Most High, presuming that they could enter his presence on their own merit in their own way, as having the power to choose what the Almighty should accept from them. And we see this today in the way so many worship God on their own terms and on their own days. This is not a judgment that occurred because they were under a different covenant. It was not just how God handled rebellion and disobedience. He did similar in Acts chapter 5 with Ananias and Sapphira. The difference today is that we do not have his manifest presence among us. The heavenly fire is missing whenever complete dedication and unity amongst his people is missing. But we see that through the scriptures, the Holy One and his fire falls on the sacrifices that are offered with hearts completely dedicated to him. As it is written in 1 Kings 18.38 in regards to Eliyahu, then the fire of Adonai fell and consumed the ascension offering and the wood and the stones and the dust and licked up the water that was in the trench. But the fire will consume those who come before him in arrogance and self-will. If we want to experience the glory of Adonai's fire in our lives, we must give ourselves as ascension offerings with hearts completely dedicated to him. Then... The fire will fall as in Acts 2, verse 3, where the Ruach HaKodesh fell like tongues of fire and appeared distributed amongst all who were there. As the text continues, the connection is made to the requirement to make a distinction between the holy and the profane and the clean and the unclean. This is where the balance of the portion begins to rivet our attention, for it is in this verse where the Hebrew word badal, translated for distinction or separation, becomes the primary emphasis. Here the royal priesthood, the nation of priests, the children of Israel, who have been called out, as, I de as I, the prophet Isaiah declared centuries later, to be a light to the nations, are here commanded to make a distinction between the holy and the profane and to understand the difference between what is clean and the unclean. And Moshe called Mishael and Elzaphan, the sons of Uziel, the uncle of Aharon, and said to them, Come near, carry your brothers from before the sanctuary out of the camp 
So they went near and carried them in their robes out of the camp, as Moshe had said. Because of the centrality of their role in the revelation of the divine presence in the sanctuary that day, Aharon and his two remaining sons are forbidden to engage in any of the customary mourning practices. And it says, And Moshe said to Aharon and to Eliezer and to Itamar his sons, Let not the hair of your heads grow long, neither rend your clothes, lest you die, and lest anger come upon all the people. Your brethren and the whole house of Israel shall bewail the conflagration which God has burned. And they did according to the word of Moshe. Nadav and Avihu were consumed by the fire of Adonai for not following his commandments. Likewise, at the end of the Messianic age, unrepentant sinners will be executed by the fire of Adonai in the lake of fire, we are told in the book of Revelation. We are now living in an age of grace where, thankfully, each of our sinful actions is not met by instant divine judgment. But does knowing that we will not instantly die when we sin cause us to become lax and even callous towards sin in our lives? Do we truly walk in the fear of Adonai? Or do we fear the consequences of sin even though the results may not be immediate? Remember that sin is defined as the transgression of the Torah in 1 John 3, 4. So as time gets near to the restoration of all things, the path of righteousness is becoming narrower and narrower. And Matthew 5, 19 relates to those who teach others to disregard the laws of God as being least in the kingdom. And so the Holy One in the next chapter, Leviticus 11, teaches us as his children what is clean and what is unclean so that we can approach him and be in his presence. Leviticus 11 verse 44 through 45 says, For I am Adonai your God. Consecrate yourselves therefore and be holy, for I am holy. And you shall not make yourselves unclean with any of the swarming things that swarm on the earth. For I am Adonai, who brought you up from the land of Egypt to be your God. Thus you shall be holy, for I am holy. This week's Torah portion contains the laws of distinguishing between clean and unclean animals. The Bible says that those animals which God designates as unclean are not to be regarded as food. When God speaks about that which is unclean and clean in Scripture, he is not referring to physical cleanliness. God has taken everything in the world and divided it into these two categories, that which is clean and that which is unclean. Everything unclean he has placed in the category of sin and death, whereas everything clean is in the realm of life and righteousness. Coming into contact with anything which God has declared unclean by either touching or eating it renders a person tamay in the Hebrew, which means spiritually unclean. That means they have come into contact with what God has declared to be in the realm of sin and death. This does not mean that the person is now physically or morally unclean, but that they are spiritually unclean and therefore unable to participate in communal worship. They will remain in this tamay state until they have taken the necessary steps to become tahor, or clean again. So the cash root laws were given to us for the purpose of being holy and clean, because our God is holy. 1 Peter 1, 13-16 says, Therefore gird up your minds, be sober, hope perfectly on the grace to be brought to you, at the revealing of Yeshua, as obedient children, do not be conformed to the previous lust of your former ignorance, but like the Holy One who called you, be holy yourselves also in all of your conduct, because it is written, you shall be holy, for I am holy. The reason why God gave us the dietary commandments and why certain animals such as pigs, shrimp, crabs, lobster, and birds of prey are considered inedible 
is because Hashem is a holy God who makes distinction between the clean and the unclean, and he wants us to live it out in our daily lives. Many Christians might scoff at the idea that separating clean and unclean meats is archaic and part of the Old Testament, as you often hear. But how many of the same fail to separate the clean and unclean when choosing friends? How many of the same fail to separate clean and unclean when reading books or watching television or looking up internet sites? You see, even the smaller principles as they relate to what we eat can have larger consequences. For when we learn to separate small things that he considers acceptable versus unacceptable, we will learn how to separate much larger things and be a part of his separated people that he desires. In fact, the word for holiness is kodesh, which means to be set apart. And he desires us to be a set apart people. In fact, our food is one of the most important things that marks the difference between the children of Israel and other people. This chapter teaches us that what man eats is very important to Hashem. From the beginning, he has been very interested in our diet. One of the first commandments given to man had to do with food back in Gan Eden. And sin came into the world through forbidden food. So if what man eats is so important to Hashem, it ought to be important to us as well. Hashem is the one who determines what is important and what is of less importance for man. The scriptures teach us that what we eat is very important. Thus, food has a lot to do with consecration and sin in the context of the priest being consecrated in this parasha. And we are told that we are to be a kingdom of priests in the messianic age. And so it's very important for anyone who desires to be a part of this kingdom priesthood to observe God's dietary laws in Leviticus 11. It is interesting to note that in the first century, there was tens of thousands of Torah observant believers, according to Acts 21.20, which says, You see, brother, how tens of thousands of Jews have believed, and all of them are zealous for the Torah? Thus, all believers should be zealous for keeping the Torah in an attitude of devotion and reverence for the Holy One of Israel. Thus, if Israel, especially the believers in Yeshua as Messiah ben Yosef among Israel and those who are grafted into Israel, see the importance of maintaining our identity as a holy nation, just like our spiritual forefathers did by expressing it through the Torah of the dietary laws, then why should anyone be discouraged from it? The biblical word for kosher means to be straight, right, and acceptable and involves laws in many different areas, including health issues, holiness, not defiling the body, as our body is the temple of God's set-apart spirit. Also, separation issues were to act, live, eat, worship, think, dress, and talk differently than the heathens around us. We are a called out and sanctified, set-apart people Therefore, we do not have the liberty to act, speak, dress, eat, and live the way the nations do. We can't expect to be called the children of the Most High, yet live like the children of the world. We must choose who we are going to serve, God or mammon. The same God who has placed boundaries around our behavior in every other area of life has placed boundaries also around our diets. If we acknowledge that he has the authority to regulate our sexual inclinations and appetites, we must also recognize he has the authority to regulate our stomachs. Food is for the stomach, and the stomach is for food, but God will do away with both of them. Yet the body is not for immorality, but for the Lord. And the Lord is for the body. 
Rabbi Shaul says in 1 Corinthians 6, 13. In chapter 11 here, instructions are given with regard to clean and unclean foods. The dietary laws of Kashrut were lovingly given to protect us. God said in Exodus 23, verse 25, You shall worship yod heh vav your God, and he shall bless your bread and your water, and I shall remove illness from the midst of you. Oftentimes, many of the diseases that scourge and ravage our bodies today are brought on because of what we eat. We eat unwholesome foods, junk and fast foods, which were not sanctified biblically. These unwholesome foods over a period of time begin to attack our bodies with sickness and lead to many chronic illnesses that are preventable if we follow the prescribed diets that were given to us biblically by our Creator. We would greatly enhance our quality and length of life if we were to follow Hashem's instruction in this area. It's sad that many brethren are led to believe that it's acceptable to eat things such as pig. They readily quote 1 Timothy 4, verses 3 and 4, which says, Forbidding to marry and commanding to abstain from meats which God has created to be received with thanksgiving of them which believe and know the truth. For every creature of God is good and nothing to be refused if it be received with thanksgiving. On face value, this particular passage of scripture would do nicely to license one to eat whatever he or she wishes, since every creature God has created is good, and that nothing is to be refused if received with prayer and thanksgiving, right? This, in fact, is a good example of taking a text out of context. Many who quote and use this text fail to read the next verse, 5, which says, for it is sanctified by the word of God and prayer. Sanctification means that which is set apart and holy. And in order for us to know what is sanctified by God's word, we would need to return to the book of Leviticus and read chapter 11, which details for us the laws of Kashrut. Thus, unclean animals are not holy. They're not set apart. They were never intended as food and God does not want us to eat them. To make ourselves unclean is to not be able to enter his presence. If we are what we eat, then by mere deductive reasoning, we can logically conclude that if we eat that which is not sanctified by God's word, then are we not eating what pagans eat? This, of course, places us smack in the middle of idolatry. In order for our bread to be blessed, we would first need to worship him and follow his word. In order to worship Hashem, it requires us to obey his commandments in his word. And if we obey his commandments, then we are entitled to all his many benefits. So let us not fall for those entrapments of apostasy, but let us return to our first love, which is our creator who gives us this beautiful instruction, knowing our bodies because he is the one who has created them. As Rabbi Shaul says, let us run this race with endurance. In chapter 11, verse 4, and then again reiterated in verse 47, we see the word unclean as tame, meaning defiled, impure, polluted ethically, ritually, and religiously. And the word clean is tahor, which means pure physically, ceremonially, morally, and ethically. In verse 43, God says that in eating unclean meats, one becomes abominable or detestable. In other words, filthy and unable to draw near to him. In Ezekiel 22, verse 26, Hashem rebukes his people because her priests have violated my Torah law and have profaned my set-apart holy things. They have put no difference between the set-apart and the profane and polluted. Neither have they showed difference between the unclean and the clean. And they have hid my eyes from my Shabbats, and I am profaned among them. 
In Leviticus 11, verse 45, the Torah states, For I am Hashem that brings you up out of the land of Egypt to be your God. You shall therefore be holy, for I am holy. What is Hashem trying to tell us here about the foods we eat? Is this more than just an issue of physical health? Why the mention of leaving Egypt here? There are many issues here that need to be explored. How serious are you about obedience to the creator of all the universe? Is your God your belly? Do your taste buds or the word of God rule your life? Remember, Torah covers all aspects of life, physical, spiritual, emotional, relational, etc. Torah is a very holistic handbook on life and how to have life more abundantly. Are you one who takes the humanistic pick-and-choose approach to Torah obedience, doing that which is convenient or feels right? Some people say, I'll obey only the biblical dietary laws that suit me. Isn't this akin to what the serpent told Adam and Hava in the garden? You can have it your way. Hashem didn't really mean what he said when it comes to obedience. People do the same thing in regards to his holy day, saying they can keep any day of the week, but God has told us which days are set apart as holy to him. We obey God simply because his word is eternal. And we know, as the creator of all things, he knows that which will bring us life and blessings, as Moshe said when he presented the Torah to the people. It is certainly true that when we obey the commandments, we will have a long life and health in our bodies. It is also true that the meat of several of these unclean animals is harmful and may contain things that are dangerous for man to eat. And, in fact, modern science has confirmed that which God has told his people was best for their health and longevity thousands of years ago. It is also true that the nature of the animal is in the blood, and if one eats part of their blood, which is almost unavoidable when eating meat, It is possible that the nature of the animal affects the character of the person who eats it. These things are secondary, however, and the Torah does not focus on them. The Torah says that one who avoids eating certain animals that have been classified by heaven as unclean will be consecrated. These rules have mainly to do with consecration, and consecration has a lot to do with food. Obedience to these commands will also bring healing, a byproduct of this obedience, which is health and prosperity and longevity in all things. But the main purpose for these commandments for us to focus on in the context of being a consecrated and set apart kingdom of priest is to be consecrated to God according to his word and what he says sets us apart as holy. He instructs us in this chapter that animals have to have a split hoof and chew the cud. Horses chew the cud but do not have a split hoof. Rabbits chew the cud but do not have hoof. Pigs have a split hoof but don't chew the cud. So those animals are all considered unclean. Here are most of the Torah clean animals from Leviticus 11. Sheep, goats, cows, deer, oxen, buffalo, and even moose, if you're a hunter hunting in the wilds of the north, all have split hooves and chew their cud. Here's some animals that are considered unclean because they do not have split hoofed and chew their cud. Dogs, cats, possums, squirrels, rats, ferrets, monkeys, kangaroos, elephants, rhinoceros, and all reptiles. In the category of fish, they need to have both fins and scales to be clean. It would be easier to list a few of the common unclean fish than all of the clean. So among the unclean are catfish, squid, octopus, shellfish, dolphin, whale, jellyfish, 
crab, shrimp, eel, mussels, abalone, clams, and this kind of seafood that does not have both fins and scales. Fish with fins and scales live in the higher and clearer waters. They are sustained by the air that enters there and therefore their bodies contain a certain amount of heat which counteracts the abundance of moistness of the waters. The fish which do not have fins and scales dwell in the lower turbulent waters and cannot repel the abundance of moistness in their native habitat. Hence the cold fluid in the area in which they swim cleaves to them as well as the fact that they are scavengers and as such can cause death to people who consume them. In 2 Corinthians 6, verses 16 and 17, we read, And what agreement has the temple of God with idols? For you are the temple of the living God, as God has said, I will dwell in them and walk in them, and I will be their God, and they shall be my people. Wherefore, come out from among them, and be ye separate, says the Lord, and touch not the unclean thing, and I will receive you. The issue of clean and pure versus unclean and polluted and abominable meats is not simply a dietary health consideration, but a spiritual issue with Hashem. Both Moshe, as we see in Leviticus 19.2, and the apostolic writers had a clear sense of the fact that without holiness, no one will see Hashem. And that holiness, or being kadosh, set apart from the ways, lifestyles, and ideologies of this world, is an absolute requirement of Hashem for his people. Is it possible to spiritualize away the concept of set apart holiness and still be true to scripture? Can one be spiritually sanctified through the atoning work of Yeshua, but then have a polluted lifestyle? In other words, can one follow the spirit of the law and violate the letter and still be acceptable to God? What did Yaakov, Yeshua's brother, who wrote the book of James, say about faith without works? In James 2.20, faith without works is dead. What did Yeshua teach at the Sermon on the Mount in Matthew 5 through 7 about uniting the letter and the spirit of the law and practicing both? The Ruach HaKodesh enables us now to keep his commandments and convicts us when we are about to violate his commandments. This creates more liberty for those who have received the Messiah and the Holy Spirit. We are no longer under a system where we are bound to consult a written code of interpretation of the Torah. The law is spiritual and a liberated spirit whose heart is renewed in such a way as to desire to obey, motivated by love, walks in complete freedom and liberty while keeping the commandments because they are not burdensome when you love the Lord. We become holy, kadosh set apart people through God's covenant that he's given to our forefathers and through the keeping of his commandments, following the example of Yeshua, who was a living Torah and kept the commandments as a Zadik. We remain sanctified by retaining our fellowship with him by confessing and forsaking our transgression of the Torah on a regular basis. 1 John 1, verses 6 through 9 says, If we say that we have fellowship with him and walk in darkness, which is another way of saying our own ways, sinning, transgressing the Torah, and justifying it, he says we lie, we don't have any fellowship with him, and we do not know the truth. But if we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship one with another, and the blood of Yeshua his son cleanses us from all sin. If we say that we have no sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Hallelujah. Isaiah 
118 says, Come now and let us reason together, says the Lord. Though your sins be as scarlet, they shall be as white as snow. Though they be red like crimson, they shall be as wool. God cares about our entire being, body, soul, and spirit. Even as Rabbi Shaul said in 1 Thessalonians 5.23, we are to worship and serve him with the totality of our being. And this is why the Shema says to love the Lord our God with all of our heart and with all of our soul and with all of our strength. At the beginning, he made us in his own image and likeness in Genesis 1.26, and he gave instructions as to what we were to eat. The original sin was in regard to what was eaten. Man chose to disobey this and eat from the wrong tree, the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, contrary to the command of God. There is a saying, you are what you eat. Adam and Eve sinned when they ate of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. They became a mixture defiled by what they ate. That which is pure and set apart is good, while that which is polluted, defiled, and unclean is evil and called an abomination in the eyes of the Lord. What are some other ways that we defile and pollute the temple of our bodies? Alcohol, nicotine, junk food, pornography, fornication, watching immoral or unrighteous movies and television, engaging in gossip, lashon hara, slander, and wrong thoughts, lust, bitterness, pride, just to name a few. Have you turned away from eating things which are abominable physically and also that which pollutes you spiritually? Traditions of men which nullify the word of God, lies, false doctrine, false teachings, false prophets, and false messiahs, those we reverence and from whom we take counsel. We need to cleanse ourselves from every defilement of the flesh and the spirit and be clean in his sight. Amen? Babylon means mixture or confusion. And in the last days, God is calling his people out of Babylon. In Revelation 18.4, he says, Come out of her, my people, that you participate not in her sins and receive not of her plagues. So we must ask ourselves, from which tree are we feeding? From the tree of the knowledge of good and evil? Or from the tree of life? May it be the tree of life for his Torah and his divine character are the attributes of the tree of life in which there is no mixture. So, in summary, this parasha of Shemini contains 17 new mitzvot, and these are comprised of six positive commandments and 11 prohibitions. And in closing, I will just share them with you and their source in brief so you can become more familiar with the origin of our mitzvot. In chapter 10, verse 6, we get the mitzvot that the priest should not enter the temple with hair grown long. And also, we get the second mitzvot that the priest should not enter the temple with torn clothing. In the next verse, in chapter 10, verse 7, we get the mitzvah that the priest should not go out from the temple in the middle of their holy service. And in verse 9, we get the mitzvah that the priest should not enter the temple having drunk wine, nor should any judge give a ruling while intoxicated. Then, in chapter 11, the majority of our mitzvah commandments are contained regarding that which is clean versus that which is unclean. And we see in chapter 11, verses 2 and 3, the mitzvah of examining the signs of domestic and wild animals to determine if they are kosher and clean. In verses 4 through 7, we get the mitzvah that we are not to eat a non-kosher species of domestic or wild animal. And in chapter 11, verse 9, we get the mitzvah of examining the signs of a fish. In verse 11, we get the mitzvah not to eat 
a non-kosher species of fish. And in verse 13, we get the mitzvah not to eat a non-kosher species of bird. In verse 21, the mitzvah of examining the signs of locusts to determine if they are kosher is given. And in verse 29 and 30, the laws of ritual impurity of the eight different kinds of crawling creatures are given. In verse 34, the laws of ritual impurity of food are given. And in verse 39, the laws of ritual impurity of animal carcasses is given. In verse 41, we get the mitzvah not to eat creatures that crawl on the earth. And in verse 42, we get the mitzvah not to eat the species of minute insects that come from grains and fruits. And then in verse 43, we get the mitzvah not to eat creatures that swarm in the water. And in verse 44, our 17th and last mitzvah is not to eat of swarming creatures that come into being from decaying matter. So, now I open it up for you and your questions and comments and to Midrash about this parasha of Shemini with its focus on the priest being consecrated by being set apart in holiness and only partaking of that which is clean in the temple, and the focus on our dietary laws as a kingdom of priests, keeping our temple clean and holy. I hope this teaching has blessed you and helps you walk in that holiness in such a way in your life that you can draw even closer to our loving Heavenly Father.